So today uh, I would like to uh, discuss another application of the same methods, well, similar methods that have been um, let's see, describing so far. Uh, and specifically, I want to discuss how to define whole conductance as a topological invariant uh, of, a, of a 2D gap systems in the sense that it's an invariant of a phase. Uh, and for that, I need to define what a phase is. But I'll start with the, you know, explaining how to define the whole conductance, and then it will be well I'll later explain in what sense it's invariant of a phase. Um, so the, this uh, talk is uh, this lecture is based on a paper with uh, uh, Nikita Sopenka. It's already online, uh, but we were, we were inspired by this earlier work by uh, four authors, Bachmann and others, um, which applied uh, somewhat similar methods to define a related invariant called uh, uh, Thales, uh, Thales charge pump. So, um, right, so, so let's see. So what are the setup? The setup as again lattice systems uh, with U, now with U1 symmetry. So now, um, so whole conductance should be definable for any, any gapped system with a U1 symmetry. So Hamiltonian then, is, as before, is a sum over lattice point, and, oh. and each term here is a local observable uh, uh, centered uh, at point. Sorry for a naive question. So the whole conductance don't kind of uh, know should it be two dimensional or? Yes. Uh, well, for now it's our uh, system is arbitrary, but in the beginning I'll just discuss you one symmetry in general context. Okay. Thank and you. Then I'll specialize to two dimensions. Uh, many of the constructions can be made uh, yeah, in, in, a general, in a general context. So, um, so, okay, so here we have this local Hamiltonian, and well, for simplicity, uh, I'll assume, well, the Hamiltonian is finite range, although that's actually, we'll see later, it's not strictly necessary. You can have like just exponential decaying interaction, that's fine too. So, the, um, the electric charge operator similarly is sum of local terms. And here I'll be a bit more. Um, Specific in the sense that now my, well, I'll assume there's strict on site symmetry. Yeah, even though, again, it's not strictly necessary. So, the on site symmetry means that each of these charge operators, local charge operators, just acts on a particular site. So, it belongs to the algebra of variables localized on a particular site and exponentiates, to, well, has integer eigenvalues. I write it this way. Um, so, these are all just so. So um, operator QP and HP are perfectly nice observables, but their formal sums are just formal sums. And so this H and Q are not really elements uh, in the algebra of observables. We'll see later, well, it's gonna actually, what are they good for? Well, what they are good for is to define um, uh, things like symmetry. So first of all, what is symmetry? Well, symmetry just means that your each local term is invariant under U1 symmetry, it commutes with the total charge. And this is well defined, even though Q is not uh, an observable, because take a commutator only um, since HP has a finite range, really only a few terms here are non zero. So this is well defined. And more generally, if you have some local observable, uh, then you can define its commutator with the charge without any problem. So, um, well, okay, strictly speaking, it's like a, some care is needed because, um, um, uh, okay, so. Okay, for, for local observable, uh, localized in some finite set, that's certainly well defined. Um, so, and uh, that's a variation of A under C1 symmetry. So this condition just says that uh, each term is separately one invariant. And, um, well, this is a local transformation in the sense that if A is localized in some finite subset, then its variation is also localized in the same subset. Um, Okay, so well, of course the most important point about uh, gap system with U1 symmetry is that uh, there's uh, that is that there's no there can be no spontaneous symmetry breaking in the situation. That's the Goldstone theorem. Now, um, so in other words, contrary uh, that is, uh, if we assume that the system is gapped and U1 invariant, then the ground state is automatically one U1 invariant too. Usually stated in the opposite direction, saying that well, if you have a um, if you have a broken U1 symmetry, then you must have gapless modes. Here we just, just exactly the opposite. It's equivalent state. So now, therefore, we should be able to prove 
that for any local observable, um, uh, the average of um, its variation is zero. So, um, well, strictly some, some well, that's actually the precise meaning of the statement that there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking. See, this charge operator is not a bounded operator. So, uh, what, what what you get if, if you act with the charge operator on the vacuum is not clear. It's not well defined typically. But this statement is pretty well defined. Well, actually, some care is needed here too because see. Um, this variation, this commutator defines an unbounded derivation of the algebra observables. Meaning, well, it's unbounded, so it's actually not defined on the whole uh, algebra A. It's defined on some dense subset. So derivation just means this. So this property. So, but anyway, you cannot uh, define it for all uh, um, elements of the algebra, but you can define it on some dense subset. Actually, there's a very nice dense subset where it can be defined. So, namely, the I call it uh, almost local observables, some subalgebra of A, plays an important role in what follows. And the way it's defined is that, uh, well, you say that an, uh, an element of the algebra is inside this subalgebra if it can be approximated by local observables with uh, very good accuracy. That is, you can always find some ball if, for any, if you uh, if you get a take a ball of radius r, you can find an observable which is local and localized in this ball. So that it, it's a very uh, close and norm to A. So, the, so um, equivalently, by the way, so one can also say differently. One can say that if you can, if you, the commutator of this A with some strictly local observable, far from, sorry, far from it, is exponentially small, like uh, super polynomially small in the radius, then it's almost local. This is the equivalent state. So this, this are, uh, almost local observables are just as good as local, but they're more flexible. Uh, and for these observables, since they're very well localized, uh, this commutator here is well defined. So you know, this derivation is unbounded. Uh, unbounded derivation is well defined in the subalgebra. And more, moreover, it's easy to see that it actually maps the subalgebra to itself. Okay. So strictly speaking, we need to we want to um, uh, we want to prove this. For this dense subalgebra, because that's where this delta Q is defined. And that implies then, if you exponentiate this Q to an actual U1 symmetry transformation, that will imply that uh, expectation value of the U1 transform of any almost local observable uh, is unchanged, well, is, uh, is the same as before transformation, that is U1 invariance. And that, that then ex extends to the whole algebra, because you know, while, while um, infinitesimal U1 transformation given by this delta, the derivation are only well defined in this dense subalgebra. The actual finite you want transformation is defined, of course, for on the whole algebra. Okay. So, um, so how do we know that this is true? So, so this is just this follow from our assumptions. It's a, so you might wonder why I proved this Goldstone theorem, but you see the, the method of proof will actually suggest some important um, uh, constructions. Um, so actually, I think this proof is probably the simplest proof of Goldstone theorem. Uh, basically, one line, once if you know what you're doing. So, so the point is that uh, one can find. Um, so it's not true. Well, okay, it's good. even though the, you know, roughly speaking, the whole charge and now is the vacuum. But as we already discussed, the total charge is not really a well-defined operator from Hilbert's. So it doesn't make sense of that. Now, on the other hand, if you look at the, uh, the genetic representation of an individual term like that. Of course, separately, they do not annihilate the vacuum. However, one can find improved observables, I call them Q tilde, such that um, they do annihilate the vacuum, and such that this new observable is, is a new charge, improved charge on the side P is actually the same as the old one up to this kind of term. So, Formally, if you sum over all p, this extra term drops out. So in that sense, q tilde p uh, is, is as good as qp because after sum all the sides, uh, you know, there's no difference between them. And here, um, you know, this k is anti-symmetric anti in q and p, some operator, depending on pair of points, which is q-symmetric. So this improvement doesn't somehow doesn't change the total charge, but it, it, it gives you a short charge and a vacuum point by point wise. So in our language of our previous lecture, um, K is a one chain, operator valued one chain. And so, so 
I like to write this way using this uh, boundary operator on chains. While Q and Q tilde are zero chains. So it's saying when we correct the zero chain Q by adding some exact term to make uh, uh, this condition true. Um, okay, suppose we manage to do that. Suppose we know that such an improvement exists. I'll, see, uh, that, uh, I'll sh sh show later why, how to construct such an improvement. But then the Goldstone theorem is proved very easily. Yes, well, but I so, um, okay, it should be more specific. When I say I have some uh, chains, well, I'm gonna use uh, chains valued in uh, not just the whole, not the whole algebra, but in this uh, uh, subalgebra, almost local operators, so that various combinators are well defined. Uh, anyway, so, so I want to improve such that this K actually lives in this subalgebra. So anyway, so um, by the way, so once you're talking about this language of chains and cochains, well, if you have some chain like this, for example, like this, you can contract it with a, um, um, some characteristic zero cochain of x, it's just the characteristic function of a subset. And if uh, x is a finite subset, that gives you a well-defined operator. And similarly for q. So and if you ask what, what the, what's the relation between this input charge on, on site on subset X and the old one. Well, they differ simply by, well, if you do some integration by parts, you will see that they differ by something which lives on the boundary of X. So contraction of K with, well, see, this delta F of X is somehow concentrates everything on the boundary of X. So the, the improved charge differ only by terms which are concentrated, operated which are concentrated on the boundary of the subset X. And that's the key point. So the point is, first of all, that when you evaluate this uh, commutator of uh, the, uh, your, your charge with some local, or some all moderable, well, by definition, it's the limit of these commutators as you take ever increasing sets X. But by assumption, uh, well, first, uh, if you plug in, what is it called? X uh, differs from Maybe there's some minus n and from q tilde x by this boundary terms. q tilde x point wise analyzes the vacuum. so when it's sandwiched between the vacuum states, you know the, the commutator of q tilde x with anything has ever a zero average. So you're left only with second term, but the second term is written on the boundary of the subset. So this commutator, even before taking the average, is, you know, is very small when x is large. So if you take x to infinity, this just becomes zero, even before taking the average. So, um, so that falls on theorem. Uh, so, so it's clear from there, well, it, so this of course is much more structure than the Goldstone theorem requires, but uh, it's actually a very important fact that you can improve uh, your charge by adding this exact operator added chain to it. So similar, uh, similar manipulations occur many in the proof of many different results. Uh, for example, similar thing can be done for the Hamiltonian itself. Like if you have a typical Hamiltonian, which is some of local terms, well, supposedly annihilates the vacuum uh, in whatever sense, uh, in, in some sense, again, some bounds would be tricky to define this. But each term separately can, doesn't uh, annihilate the vacuum. However, I can improve the Hamiltonian in a similar way to make, to rewrite it as some of different terms, each of which does annihilate the vacuum. In that sense, every Hamiltonian can be rewritten as a frustration-free Hamiltonian. It's every single Hamiltonian, piece of the Hamiltonian now is the vector. With similar manipulations. So that's, uh, by the way, it's a well-known result. And uh, I don't know where, this proof is probably somewhere in the literature, even though something similar should be in the literature. Uh, but anyway, the point, um, so anyway, so how do I want to construct this one chain? Well, let me, uh, another useful construction is how to think about currents on the lattice. So this essentially appears in this appendix uh, D or C of Kitaev's Honeycomb model paper. In the case of, I think, ener uh, energy current, but similar things that's works for electric current. So let's do the electric currents for, for our purposes more useful. The car what's a current? Well, again, current is by definition is something which makes this equation true. So the derivative of a charge at some site is equal to sum over, uh, on, over currents from all other points to, to the site P. It's some operator like that. So in principle, any solution of this equation, so this one, or this one, is, is, a, is a possible current. 
Now, um, it is an obvious way to solve this, of course. Here it is. Uh, so you can easily check that it just tautologically solves this equation. Um, and by assumption, I want, well, my assumption is I want J to be Q symmetric because it makes, I want the uh, current from Q to P to be minus the current from P to Q. So this is a canonical solution. It's sort of canonical, but you can ask, okay, wait a second, to what extent is it canonical? If, if any, any solution works, how, how many solutions do, do I actually have? So, so, sorry, Anton, I, I, I'm not quite sure how do you skew symmetrize it. If you, if you took just one of the terms that would certainly be in a solution to your equation, but what about the second term? Well, the point is after sum over Q, so my total charge commutes with each local term. Wow. So okay. that's what I added for can add for free. So it's a you one you one variance of the Hamiltonian, which makes okay. it work. Okay, thank you. Right. So I added, but it's actually important to make it symmetric because then it becomes this chain. Um, so you can ask, well, plus it physically makes more sense, you know. So to, to have a symmetry. Now you can ask, um, well, how does does one well parameter is a general ambiguity? Well, there's some sort of obvious ambiguity. You can, of course, uh, add some, you can add um, um, uh, something exact, some boundary of some two chain with various and almost local operators. You might wonder whether you can add something more, something more elaborate, because after all, you need something close, something, which, you know, you can add something which is close to this and it's going to work. So, why I'm, so I'm saying basically that everything close is actually exact. Is it really true? Well, you need to show that this is false, because there's, there's no homology in degree one. So that statement is actually slightly dimension dependent. And listen, for the subtlety, it's really not the, uh, the homology with constant coefficients I need here, but homology with local coefficients. Local in the sense that I have the current going from P to Q. I want that operator to be localized somewhere around P and Q. I don't want it to be localized God knows where. Right? So it's a local coefficient statement I need here. So now this is like getting a bit uh, hairy because, well, this is homology, chain complex. And what I'm supposed to do here, well, it, it's some sort of a, I guess, uh, it's, it, it's a simplicial uh, chain complex of some sort. And uh, like what, what local coefficients are usually done for cohomology, not homology. Some sort of funny thing is going on here. I'm not going to get into this. I think it's, it's actually still a true statement. Uh, uh, that homology is zero, well, this is a further subtlety. In, if, if you're doing the dimension one system, then homology with non-constant coefficients, like with constant coefficients, is actually not trivial. As I, as I just mentioned, uh, the homology with constant coefficients is non-vanishing when the dimension is equal to the degree. So in dimension one, actually, there is a non-trivial homology. Like, what's going on there? Well, there's a further natural requirement which you want to impose on any sensible current. Namely, suppose you have infinite temperature, which makes sense in like lattice systems. You probably want to say that the current, expectation value of a current is zero. So that's usually assumed because uh, nothing is flows anywhere at infinite temperature. Now, um, so you can normalize, if you normalize our currents always like that, then even in dimension one, there'll be no like homology, not, not no interesting homology. The statement that there are no currents in equilibrium is actually usually stated as a theorem, something called Bloch's theorem, due to Felix Bloch. Uh, and here we see that actually, in one dimension, you sort of have to force it upon yourself. You know, it's nothing. You know, it's, it's a natural condition. In higher dimensions, it's just you know, it's something you, you, you don't assume. It's just uh, it's there for free, in some, some sense. But in, in dimension one, you have to sort of enforce it. It's a natural physical requirement. Anyway, so. So if I define the current, what does it do with this Goldstone theorem? Well, it, it actually turns out that you can construct improvement term for the charge from the current, from any current, doesn't matter which current. You can construct it this way. We can just say, well, there's, uh, there's some solution to this equation. If there's any solution, uh, it's good enough for me. So, um, so what is the, um, um, yeah, so what is the uh, construction? Well, here's another key in ingredient, something called quasi-diabetic continuation. I'll just call it quasi-diabetic map because nothing is continuing here. So I'm describing this paper by Hastings. So, um, so what is this thing? Well, um, 
there is a following. So you can try to, you, can, you want to define a map from an algebra to itself, from the algebra to itself in the following way. You take, it's take some element of the algebra, evolve it a little bit in time, and then smear over all times with some function which decays rapidly in time. Now, uh, so this, if the function decays rapidly in time, like this, then, uh, and if the Hamiltonian is uh, short range, short range, then it's, it stands to reason that, that this operator, new operator, is gonna be still, if A was localized uh, very well, then this guy is also gonna be localized well. The point is that evolution for a finite time just smears out the operator a little bit. Uh, and, uh, well, if you evolve for a long time, then of course it's gonna spread out over the whole system, but then this function is suppressing you there anyway. So the operator, this, this transformation from A to this guy, maps one of a very low, well localized operator to another very well localized operator. And what else do we want from this function? Well, we also want some additional Fourier transform. We want this Fourier transform to be very simple like this, when uh, omega is large enough, specifically above some delta which itself is below the gap of the Hamiltonian. So this, op 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 this map is called quasi-debatic continuation. And actually, it maps uh, not just A to A, it maps almost local observables to almost local observables. So it's a very nice uh, map. And uh, roughly speaking, what it does, it's like um, Excuse me. multiplying your operator by like one over uh, Hamiltonian projected to the... Um, um, yeah, Anton, um, can kind of write you probably, it, it, is it a different slide now? Because oh, uh, pros. Okay, let's see. I think I should yeah. restart sharing. Maybe, yeah. Uh, maybe you stop sharing and then start sharing again. Stop sharing, then start, start sharing again. That did happen sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh okay. So right. So we haven't seen this slide yet, just, just to yeah, tell you. So I want to define some map. Uh, so map, this map is written due to Hastings, which uh, roughly speaking is like, um, the, it's one, it multiplies the operator, but something like one over the Hamiltonian. Uh, so in Fourier space, uh, so, so you would want to multiply by, by, by one over the frequency, something like that. So, um, so this map is in fact as follows. So it, it only works for gap systems. Uh, so that is the following. First, you, you pick some number delta, which is between zero and the gap of the Hamiltonian. Then you pick some function, doesn't matter which one, which so this has the following conditions. So it's, it's, a, it's actually odd function, so you could say it's a continuous odd function. And it decays very, very rapidly for large values of the argument. And it's Fourier transform is required to satisfy this for large enough frequencies. Large enough meaning bigger than delta. Other than that is arbitrary function. And then you smear your observable, you, you evolve your observable for time t, this is just evolution operator here. And then you smear it in t using this function. Okay. So roughly speaking, what this does is basically multiplies your, fun, your operator by like one over the Hamiltonian, roughly speaking. Uh, uh, and that's not co makes, doesn't make sense uh, but it does make sense if you sort of uh, project out the contribution of the ground state, because on the, on the rest of this uh, Hilbert space, this A is invertible. The Hamilton is invertible. The point is you can actually do it on the level of C star algebra. You don't have to go to Hilbert. So you can actually do it on the level of C star algebra and another local observable. So, and easy check is, is that if you just let, uh, easy computer, you can just let this K, this improvement, current improvement month chain to be just this transform applied to the usual current, to the electric current one chain. And you can verify that this satisfies all the requirements. So this trick uh, also works for Hamiltonians as I already mentioned. You can improve your Hamiltonian so that each local term in the Hamiltonian annihilates your ground state. And uh, uh, in that case, you just use uh, uh, not the electric current, but energy current. That I think is actually uh, discussed in uh, Kitaev's uh, appendix, Kitaev's paper on the Honeycomb model. Okay, 
Now I finally, well, with this preparation, when I'm finally ready to, do, to define the whole conductance. So the point is that um, uh, although well, the, the original um, charges, different sides commute, even on the same, well, they always, always commute. Now, the one defect is that these improved charges do not commute in general. Nobody said that they will. Uh, nevertheless, since they differ from the, uh, un the original Q only by exact term, uh, then you'd expect that the commutator is something exact. And that is it's true. The commutator of this chain of these uh, Qs on uh, different sides actually exact in this sense. There's some two chain, a product value two chain, such that uh, which we saw this equation. Um, by the way, there's something interesting going on here algebraically because we start with uh, this is zero chain, and now we defined uh, one chain like this. So what is this thing? So well, there's some bracket on zero chains, which uh, um, gives you one chains. It has degree uh, one, and, and it's something similar to Gersten Haber bracket. Uh, it has some similar properties, so uh, it can actually be extended to arbitrary chains to have some bracket of degree plus one and take into account that you you know if you use homological grading if you like reversed it you would get a bracket of degree minus one just like in uh, Gerson Haber case so I'm not quite sure what to make of this but anyway so this is bracket and we're using it here just for zero chain anyway so um so it turns out indeed that's true and you can actually write explicitly the solution for this uh, operator uh, two chain M, easily checked that if you just set it to be this, uh, then uh, you know it's all this equation. And by the way, this commuter here is again again example of this bracket. You start with you know it's a bracket of now of a zero chain and a one chain, and you get to take its bracket in the Gerson Haber sense, and you get like now a two chain. Okay, so um, but anyway, just a computation. You can just uh, don't need to use fancy words here. So, uh, so we have this now two chain, which measures to what extent these new uh, uh, charges do not commute. And then let's define as a numerical invariant as follows. We just take this two chain and do the following thing. We just pick some point on our plane, divide the plane into three sectors, and do what I sort of already sketched a lot less, just sum over points P, Q, and R, so that P is always in A, Q in B, and R in C. Counterclockwise, and then take the average expectation value in the back end. So this this stuff sort of sum defines some local observables localized somewhere around here, because you see when P, Q, and R are far from each other, this thing decays rapidly. So in reality, if you, if you want P always to be here and Q here and R there, then uh, all these three points uh, should be pretty close to each other. Otherwise, you'll get some appreciable contribution from this guy. So in reality, it's all localized somewhere in some neighborhood of this point. So that's a well-defined sum, even though it's infinite sum. Um, again, using the fact here that this chain is, even though it's not a, what's called a, it's not a coarse chain, but it's a co-controlled summable. So, so in other words, you can write those contraction of this uh, chain valued, well, well, of this real chain, then we contract evaluating expectation value operator value chain M with a generator of this degree to cohomology of the lattice. Um, now, um, oh, okay, so there's some bad notation here. I used brackets both, uh, in the previous lecture is brackets to denote contraction of a chain and the co-chain, and in this lecture, I have lots of expectation values. I also use these brackets. So from now on, I'm gonna use round, I'm gonna use parentheses to denote contraction of a chain and the co-chain. Well, well, brackets will still, well, angle bracket will still stand for expectation value. So, um, anyway, so that's my, some give some numerical uh, invariant in a sense. And the claim actually that, that this is up to a factor of two pi, the whole conductance. So let me, um, before explaining some spec sketching the argument, let me uh, uh, explain um, let me explain some properties of this uh, whole conductance. Um, 
Well, first of all, um, one kind of very thing to show is that this is actually independent. Or this number is independent of the choice of the point and the spats. And, and that's simply because, um, see, okay, M, so M satisfies this equation. So it was not closed, but it, uh, its um, expectation value actually is closed. Why is that? Because see, each Q tilde annihilates the vacuum. So if I sandwich this to back in the vacuum state, so this left hand side will vanish. So the right hand side will also vanish. So the expectation values are uh, do form a closed um, two chain. Right, so it's set here. So therefore, if I can shift alpha by some uh, uh, closed ca uh, ca chain, then uh, the contraction will not change simply by this talk still. So it's a relation of a cycle and a co-cycle. So it depends only on the cohomology class, which is good because you can easily see that deforming this uh, pass or a point moving in some places, just, just adding some, um, um, it, it, well, the, all generators go with like that. So and, and they all generate the same cohomology class. So uh, you can move this point anywhere, move this path pretty much anywhere too. They just have to stay away from each other. Like they should like a, shouldn't like approach each other, but if they stay in like their separate sectors, everything is fine. Okay. Now, uh, another thing is that uh, uh, this, um, 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 uh, this uh, number depends only on the state uh, and the charge, but not on the complete volume. This is much less obvious because to construct this number, I use this chain. And the definition, well, involved uh, solving this equation, the definition is and what you know tilde is. And my specific form, form for M involves K. So Q tilde, the definition of Q tilde depends on this choice of this chain K. And K seems to depend on the Hamiltonian. It has some explicit solutions for it. Uh, then this M also depends on K. So it seems like you do need to, um, uh, you do need to, to know the Hamiltonian to do to all this. Well, well, you need to know that there is some Hamiltonian whose ground state is our state. But turns out you don't need to know the exact Hamiltonian. Um, so uh, the point is that, um, well, basically we wanna fix K simply by requiring this. This is the sense that has a Q tilde annihilates the, the ground state. That is it's kind of correlator with any A zero. So if it turns out that you don't need to any specific solution, any solution will do. And one can show that solutions are unique up to this kind of ambiguity. So of course, you cannot add any, anything exact, but that easily shown doesn't affect anything because we're contracting the, the cycles anyway in the end. You can also add something which is not exact, but which annihilates the vacuum. And you can show that it also doesn't matter. And turns out that this is actually the only ambiguity. That's some trivial statement, which is tr not true for, uh, it's true precisely for, uh, uh, you can show it's true for ground states of the up Hamiltonians. So, that, so the only thing we need to use is to show that this is the only ambiguity. And that does use the fact that uh, um, our ground state is actually a ground state of a local Hamiltonian. To show that again, you need to use some, this quasi adiabatic continuation of the operation. But nothing else. So, so existence of uh, Hamiltonian is important, but its form is not important. So that's actually a special case of um, um, modular statement in, you can find in the paper, and it shows that ground states of gap local Hamiltonians are quite special. Uh, so, that, so I don't really know how to describe them among all uh, possible clustering states. So they have very very nice properties. Uh, but this, this is property which I'm using, not, not the specific Hamilton. Okay. Now, I'm afraid my battery is running out. So let me, uh, let me, uh, for now, let me bring the charger, sorry. Uh, Well, 
we do need his battery. So, okay. I think I'm back. So we try to get better in. Yes. Founder. So uh, sharing. Okay. Okay, good. We do see your screen. Okay, you can see. Okay, great. Okay, so now, so we have this uh, the numerical invariant of any gapped state, um, which, uh, well, should be something familiar and turns out to be just two pi times the whole conductance. Well, that's not very, well, to, to see that, you need first to massage various, well, there are various formulas for the whole conductance uh, in the interacting case. So the most general formula people usually write down is the Kubo formula. Uh, and this formula has been uh, uh, massaged in, in sort of a better form in this paper uh, with Les Padineko uh, uh, um, about a year ago. Uh, so one can write it in a way which is better than normal ways. And um, um, so in terms of the expectation value of the contraction of the usual current, not this improved one, usual current with some cochains. Namely, you know, the whole conductance measures uh, the flow, uh, current uh, in a um, state obtained by applying some electric field. So if you start with electric field, we, you know, crank it up from zero to some constant value and observe the current flowing in the perpendicular direction. So the way you model this, you start with some potential um, and use potential specific on the lattice, just a fun function from lattice sides to real numbers. And in this case, well, it actually turns out to be more convenient to take the non-uniform uh, potential. It's not, it's not linear. It just has uh, some potential which starts from uh, zero at say, like down here, 
and becomes one up, up there. So create electric field which goes this way. Um, and then you're asking what is the current, uh, electric current created in this direction? And well, what does it mean? Well, I have to choose some line like that and to compute current across this line. And that's expressed by contracting the usual current with the differential, well, with the co-boundary of the, uh, another function. So one of the function is just a step function in this direction, uh, this f. Uh, and then the other function, which appears to replace a differential, uh, is uh, parameterizes how your potential varies from down here to up there. Uh, so in the end, turns out doesn't matter. This physically, they're quite distinct, but the formula that you get is very symmetric in these two functions. And in fact, you can take these two functions to be anything, provided the interval is between zero and one. So this magic happens because at zero temperature, whole conductance and whole conductivity, they are the same thing. That is, it doesn't matter how your electric field actually varies. You get the same uh, uh, number. Uh, conductivity is something that you get as a limit of conductance, you need to specify some linear potential, take the range to be very large. But at zero temperature, it doesn't matter. So in the end, it turns out that you have a very symmetric and nice formula, uh, which involves uh, the currents, these two functions, uh, and um, uh, this Green's function, which I used before. So that's not quite what we want still, because it involves the these currents, which themselves depend on the, on the Hamiltonian. This is the dynamical quantities. But with some work, I'm going to rewrite it in an even better form, like this. So here, just contract this improved this current k used for improvement with uh, the same functions, and uh, take the commutator, and then uh, take expectation value. So this formula, by the way, um, kind of interesting formula because um, in the previous, uh, so this is just the usual correlator, no like Green's function or anything, just usual static correlator. It's a static correlator. So usually think about um, whole conductance something dynamical. You like you apply electric field, creates a non-equilibrium steady state, and then some current flows in some weird direction. Uh, so that's a dynamical, it's non-equilibrium statement. And that's why you have all this Green's function squared in this formula, in the usual Kubo formula. But you can massage into a form when there's nothing like that, just a static linear response basically, or some Cisco co correlation, correlation function some local observables in, uh, in the ground state. Such formulas that are known in the literature too. There's something called strata formula for the whole conductance, which is not usually very rigorous. So you can think of this as a version of this, a rigorous version of the strata formula. So um, anyway, uh, once you get reach this stage, you can already see that there is connection with the, this formula for, previous formula for sigma, because it also involves this various current scale and you can massage it further. Um, to that form. Okay, so um, so let me just say what other, pro what's other properties of sigma is. So I already said that it's a numer it's numerical invariant of a system, but actually it's a numerical invariant of a phase. Um, and um, the further properties, namely it's it turned out to be integral for short-range entangled phases. Uh, there's some argument similar to Laughlin's argument, which show that it's integral, but it's rigorous. And moreover, it's even in, an in, even integer for bosonic phases. And that's something which field theory predicts, which is stated in the first very first lecture. Chern Simon's theory, description of quantum Hall effect predicts this, but it, it's hard to make this precise. So there's some time there was spin structure. Here we have, we can prove it just uh, directly without any, uh, well, by studying statistics of flux insertions. That's another way to argue this. So it turns out that uh, this whole conductance for general systems controls statistics of flux and source in some very precise way. So um, in particular, uh, for short-range entangled phases, um, uh, the only options are bosons and fermions because there are no anions. And because of that, sigma has to be integral. That's one way to see why it's integral. But more for bosonic systems, you cannot have like uh, firm, emergent fermion in the short-range entangled bosonic system. You'd expect, therefore, that there's a further constraint that sigma is actually an even integer, and that turns out to be true. So that, that's how its argument goes. But um, I'm not going to, this pretty long argument, so I'm going to get into this, you can look at the paper. But I rather want to focus on this statement that it's an numerical invariant of a phase, because that gives me an opportunity to explain what I, what I think is the right definition of a quantum phase of matter is. 
it's an important general uh, issue. So the idea here, um, well, it's a uh, idea been around for a while, and it's been uh, uh, expounded in this book, Quantum Information Meets Quantum Matter, in some detail. So the idea is that um, um, you should really focus on states, not on the Hamiltonians. So that's uh, that's the first key point. And so when you instead of uh, you should um, uh, define a quantum phase of matter as an equivalence class of uh, uh, gap states or clustering states under some equivalence relation. So what is this relation? So there are two kinds of equivalences you want to enforce. The uh, more trivial is that if you stack some state with a trivial that is factorized state, where you know, there's no correlations at all, that gives an equivalent uh, state. That's kind of obvious uh, requirement. The stacking with some completely boring system doesn't give you anything new. It should be the same thing. But um, uh, the, 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 more, the more important equivalence is this one, called equivalence under local unitary quantum uh, circuits of finite depth. So what are these? Well, imagine you have some chain, say, a, a drawing two one-dimensional pictures, even though it's can be done in higher dimensions. You have some uh, one-dimensional system and the spins sitting on each side. OK. So this is some state. What can I do with the state? Well, I can apply quantum gates to it, and but my gates are going to have a constraint. My gates are going to have a finite. Well, each gate is going to be applied to a finite number of spins. So let's say here it's applied to two spins. Here it's a two, three spins. Here it's again to two. Uh, so the size of the gate can be can be like more than like, it can be larger, but it should be like fixed by some upper some number. It's going to be like go to infinity. Uh, and also, you you do it for a finite number, a finite number of times. So each layer here uh, is made of some infinite number of gates, and I do several layers, but they only keep number of layers finite. Um, so that's what, what finite depth refers to. In this case is depth three circuit. And what does the next act each gate? Well, in each gate is simply a unitary transformation. So this is called the local unitary quantum circuit. So you apply such local unicorn circuit to a, to a state and say, well, whatever you get is, is, an equi is uh, equivalent to the original state. It's in the same phase. Now, uh, the good thing, of course, is that, for, well, in finite system, um, all states are going to be equivalent because you can just uh, can connect any two states in this way, clearly, because you only have a finite number of spins to work with. In fact, you can take one big gate whose size is a uh, of order of the system, and then just do everything in one step. In one step, of course. Well, if you say, "Well, my size of the gate should be constant," that shouldn't grow with the size. Well, that uh, will make life harder. But you can then you can just do this thing many many times. And you have a finite system, and then in a finite time, you're going to connect any two states. That's actually a good thing because we want this um, equivalence relation to become non-trivial only in infinite volume. So that's. Uh, how uh, I think um, is one often talks about uh, phases in the language of states. These equivalence classes are under such circuits and under stacking. Now, this definition is not like very physical. It's more like quantum information theoretic and also very difficult to, to connect with the physics. So here's another one, which is um, similar. So here you replace a finite depth local unitary quantum circuit uh, with a path in the space of local Hamiltonians. But suppose you want to say that two states are equivalent. When are they equivalent? Well, so suppose you have two states called like this, average one, average zero. Uh, if I can find a path of Hamiltonians, which are gapped for all values of the parameters, over the parameter, such that initial ground states of H of zero is this guy, and the final ground state of H of one is this guy, then I say that the two states are equivalent. It's kind of homotopy, homotopic definition. Um, now this can, can actually be a phrase in a different way, um, which is better for purposes. So um, suppose, um, well, let's put some additional natural constraint. Well. Suppose uh, we, uh, we, we have a family of state. Uh, okay. So suppose uh, uh, we found such a path, and suppose in, uh, as a result, expectation value of all almost local observables are smooth function of this uh, parameter. 
That seems like a reasonable assumption. Then uh, there is a path, a path of automorphisms which connects the states. That is, there's a way uh, uh, to, there isn't some automorphism, such that if you apply automorphism and then average over the st state zero, this is the same as averaging the state for some value of lambda. So this continuous path of automorphisms. And moreover, these automorphisms have, are, very, are very nice. They're local in some sense. In what sense? Well, um, they're generate, they're basically exponents, the exponents of, um, um, of local Hamiltonians. I call here this unphysical Hamiltonian G of lambda. It's some time, well, time dependent or lambda dependent Hamiltonian. What I mean by, well, it, a better way to say it, or well, physically, you just say something like this that this automorphism is generated by this P exponent. Mathematically, you would say that expectation value satisfies this equation. So it's basically a Schrodinger type of Schrodinger equation with this unphysical, well, it's some random Hamiltonian G. The important thing about it is that it's local. It's nice. Each, each, um, um, it's a sum of local terms. It's, it's a zero chain, and each term in this chain is an almost local observable. It's a very nice. It's a nice local Hamiltonian. Well, given this uh, theorem, well, let's call such an automorphism locally generated. That is, local generated if it comes from a local Hamiltonian. That is, um, it can be written as this, or if you wish. It's an automorphism obtained by solving equations like that. So you can write it in terms of automorphisms rather than in terms of uh, the, the equation for observables. Um, so here, so therefore, um, so by, by the way, so um, now another kind of trivial observation. If you start with the uh, ground state, which is a ground state of a gapped Hamiltonian, then evolving this using, using this local generated automorphisms gives you another uh, ground state of some other gapped Hamiltonian. Uh, all that happens because you see what all that happens. Well, you can it's just basically the fact that uh, it's something along as Lee Robinson bounds that if evolving by local Hamiltonian takes local observables to local observables. So your original state was a ground state of some gap, uh, local Hamiltonian. And after you evolve it using this automorphism, it's still a ground state of some other local Hamiltonian, which is obtained by just applying this automorphism to every single term in the Hamiltonian. And moreover, um, you can show that the result is gapped. It's kind of just because, it, because of automorphism property, the original guy was gapped, that the new Hamiltonian is also gapped. So this suggests like to dispense with Hamiltonians altogether. Just say that it takes the definition. You say that the two states are equivalent if there is some locally generated automorphism which uh, connects these two states. Um, so this is similar to actually to uh, the original definition using local unitary quantum circuits. Essentially this automorphism is kind of fuzzy analog or finite depth local unitary quantum circuit. So uh, local unitary finite depth quantum circuit mixes degrees of freedom a little bit, but it, it maps uh, observable in some site the observable spread out around such, such side by some small amount, or some finite amount. Similarly, if you apply such this local generated automorphism, then Lieb Robinson bounds tell you that it's going to smear every observable, well, in principle, over the whole system, but uh, the tails are going to be exponentially suppressed or super polynomially suppressed. So it's a similar thing. But it's much better physically motivated and it's more, and it's, uh, more, more convenient. So one thing which is, uh, follows immediately from this definition is it allows you to glue, um, it allows you to uh, ensure the following very obvious kind of natural property. If you have two states in the same phase, they should be able to create the gapped interface between them. So, so that's very desirable property and it's kind of difficult to ensure if you're thinking about your states as a uh, ground states of some physical gapped Hamiltonians. But if you think of them as just ground states of some Hamiltonians, whose exact form you don't really care for, uh, then it's very easy to glue it. So to glue these ground states. So namely, so suppose you have these two states, I call them phi and phi prime. Suppose they're in the same phase, so that is you can obtain this guy on the whole plane from this guy on the whole plane by evolving for a finite time with some local Hamiltonian. Well, so that lets this Hamiltonian be G. So I glue as follows then. I just modify this G 
by by multiplying each term by a step function in x uh, in this say in x direction. So in other words, uh, when x is bigger than zero, then my homoponent is the same as before. When it's less than zero, then it's just zero. So it's kind of it seems like uh, some strange operation, but what it does, if you're far to the right, if you're all the way out here, well, that evolution actually doesn't differ from the old one. Because what happens to the left of that point, you know, far from it doesn't matter because of this locality. Uh, so out here, the new state is going to be exactly like phi prime was. Out here, it will be unchanged. It will say phi. In between, it will be something, something horrible. I don't know what it is. But the point is, whatever it is, the whole thing is still gapped. Why is it gapped? Well, because it's just evolution of the original gapped state, this one, by this funny Hamiltonian, which is zero uh, to the left of some line and something else to the right of someone. It has already argued evolving anything with a, uh, in this way gives maps a ground state of some Hamilton, of any Hamiltonian to ground states of some other gap Hamiltonian. So this just this that makes things work. Uh, so that so that's why we can. Uh, I propose to define a quantum phase of matter as an equivalence class generated by the following two equivalences. Well, by local generated automorphisms and stacking with factorized systems. And then I would define trivial phase as the equivalence class of a factorized state. And then following Kitaev, you would say the state is short entangled if it's invertible in the following sense, that if you, if you were a state, you can find some other state and another algebra, so if you stack, stack with it, then you get something in a trivial phase then you say that the original guy was, in, was short range entangled. So this psi is called the inverse of phi. So you can stack with something else to get something trivial in a trivial phase. And now I can actually explain why I say that this whole conductance is a numerical invariant of a phase, not of just of the system. It becomes completely trivial. The point is that on one hand, I know that I can draw any, this picture on any Part of the plane and get the same numerical invariant for any gap system. On the other hand, I can glue my phi and phi prime. And if I draw it and get some new gap uh, state in the same phase, well, if I measure whole conductance out here, I'm going to get, of course, what, whatever whole conductance for phi, because the system doesn't even know that something different happens on the right. If you measure it here, I'm going to get whole conductance for, for phi prime. But on the other hand, I know that there's not, nothing to depend on where, how I choose this uh, graph on the plane, because the whole thing is gapped still. So therefore, uh, they must be equal. So, and this shows that a system with non-trivial whole conductance, non-zero whole conductance, cannot have a gapped edge, because you know, it cannot have a gapped interface of the trivial phase. If it had, then they run into contradiction. So, uh, so let me just finish uh, by uh, saying um, what, what things, what our methods can and cannot, cannot do at the moment. So what we do not know how to address is, uh, in fact, a more basic numerical invariant of two-dimensional gap systems, known as the thermal hole conductance. So, um, or equivalently, chiral central charge of the edge. So uh, we, uh, there's a formula, there's a Kubo formula for this, but we don't know how to massage it to any form which would like uh, show that it's an invariant of a phase in our sense. The trouble with thermal hole conductance, it's strictly speaking defined at positive temperature. Everything I described only works at zero temperature, so I don't know how to um, what, what to do with, with thermal hole conductance. Maybe it's not even possible using our methods. Uh, on the other hand, our methods can be used to um, rewrite these WGW classes, which I defined before, using states alone. That's work in progress. Um, so, um, so before in the lecture two, I showed how to write them in terms of Hamiltonian and how, how to write these closed forms in the parameter space. But actually, it wasn't very clear why, why it should be independent of the state. But once you you can do this, uh, you, once it's possible to write in terms of the states. Um, and some interesting algebraic structure emerges. Um, and uh, where this bracket, this Gerstin Haber like bracket plays an important role. And uh, one can use the same methods 
to argue that these double double classes are quantized for shortage entangled system, at least for spherical cycles. I don't know about general ones, but on spheres, integral of double double classes actually are quantized. And there's some recursive argument which connects this double double classes uh, to the integrals of Berry curve, usual Berry curvature. And so the point being that, um, um, yeah, so some of the old descendants of the Berry curvature. So once you know that Berry curvature is quantized, you can did you on, on spheres, you can deduce that this double double classes are also quantized on spheres. Um, a very important check would be to um, see whether these double double classes are quantized not just on spheres but on arbitrary manifolds uh, arbitrary, for arbitrary families. That's what field theory predicts. And that would be a strong argument that, you know, supporting argument that evidence that uh, field theory actually is relevant. Uh, because uh, in field theory, you can put your system on any manifold, but for our lattice systems, cannot be put on any manifold. So all we have is topology in the parameter space. Uh, so um, quantization of double double classes on some non trivial manifold, not spheres, would be an important check um, of this conjecture that relates shortage entangled phases to field theory. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. <laughs>